Welcome to Horror Movies with Friends. I am your host, Andy Green, aka Wolf Mandy Scream, at least for the next, God, 25 days. We'll see if I survive another full moon. Uh, today is day six of 31, and I, 31 movies, 31 drink pairings, 31 friends, and today, family member, he checks both of the boxes, ladies and gentlemen, and it's time to in introduce my screamed guest we got uncle tom adams here tom adams welcome to this haunted zoom hey my pleasure to be here hello <laughs> out there hope you're happy watching <laughs> horror movies it's a good thing it is a good thing especially when there's rubber suits involved indeed we love so, rubber suits all right we do in this house anyway <laughs> yeah clearly and so <laughs> i don't think it'll be a big surprise what uh franchise we're we're watching from today based on your backdrop so, but tom what uh, what movie did you choose for us today godzilla versus hedera <laughs> and that's a uh, 1971 it is streaming on hbo max if you want to watch along with us or watch before we spoil the movie because there's a lot of heavy hitting moments in this that you won't want to be spoiled right tom like this is i think so a lot of surprises for a godzilla movie and uh, just so those who aren't familiar with the name Hedra, yes. it is known in the American parlance as Godzilla versus the smog monster. So Hedra is the smog monster. Yes. So the, yeah, they are interchangeable in terms of that. Good, good point. Thanks His for- real uh, name is Hedra, not the smog monster, but- Yes, we will, that, we, will, we will refer to it as Hedra, which is why I didn't even bother saying the smog monster. But yes, don't get confused. Don't go American. Go Japanese, which is a segue. Uh, Tom, are, are yes. you thirsty? Would you like to uh, have a you beverage? Know, watching, watching, uh, watching Godzilla versus Hedera. There's, there's nothing that makes me thirstier than a bunch of a screen sludge. So yes, let's uh, <laughs> cleanse our palate with something delicious rather than something awful. Well, I mean, we've been dried out, right? You know, that was Absolutely. that's that was the journey of that movie. So now <laughs> it's time to uh, correct. To to liquefy or something. Yeah, let's do it. Yes, so indeed. what we have, and this was a, a brand recommended by Tom. Uh, it's an American made sake from Oregon, but Japanese, of course, uh, creators. And it's a sake one, but it's a Yomi sake. I know that sake yeah. one is what distributes it. And that's Correct. how I got it. And, and then- Yes. For anybody interested in sake in America, that's probably the website you want to start at. There's all kinds of information, all kinds of different sakes from all over the world there, a, a, a lot from Japan and a lot made in elsewhere too. So, and it's well worth checking out that website, Sake One. Sake One. And, and I will be deferring to Tom for probably this whole episode, but especially on sake. Like I think of all the drinks that we're sampling during this month, sake, I probably know the least. But that actually makes me most excited because I have no idea what we're in for here. This is called the afterlife, which I think is, you know, chose without, uh, you know, obvious reasons why we would choose the afterlife here. Yeah. Well, and it, it is October after all. It is October. And this is vegan friendly, gluten free, kosher. It checks all the boxes there. Yep. And it is a Yunmai. Uh, Ginjo, clear. Junmai Ginjo. So Junmai just means there's no added alcohol in the brewing process. Sometimes when you're making sake, uh, you al extra alcohol is added, and it's not necessarily a character flaw in sake. Some delicious sakes are not Junmai, and so mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily any less healthy or anything like that but it is part of the process. This is a more natural process in that they don't add the alcohol. The alcohol is all fermented in. And ah, okay. uh, as, as a ginjo, that means at least 45% of the rice has been polished. The rice uh, grains are polished, meaning that 45% of the kernel is gone when you start the uh, process to make the mash and uh, for a minute. So it is a pure taste. You don't have a lot of the bran. You don't have any outside contaminants. It's the heart of the rice as it is. As it is. Wow. So dai ginjo is over 50%. And uh, ginjo, so if you're, if you're, if you want, it is going to give you a cleaner, more refined taste. Uh, and then all, all the other flavors as well. But when you're looking for 
if you're stuck on a menu and you want to pick out a sake that you don't know anything about, like we know we don't know about this one yet, um, uh, if you can get a ginjo or you can afford it, ginjo or dai ginjo, start there as an American. And when you're at the airport buying, you know, a gift coming back, check those out. They're a little more expensive because you're getting about, you know, it takes twice the rice, right? So, right. And it's, you know, it's the equivalent of like, a, yeah, a double distilled whiskey or, or something like that. Right. And so it's extra time, extra process, extra care. Yeah. And, and hopefully extra delicious. That, there we go. Let's, <laughs> I think that means it's time. To I open think it's game. time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, this is the first time for me opening a can like this of, of sake with the, you know, with the little pop top as if it were a beer. Yeah. Me, me too. Although I, you know, I feel like that's less surprising. Um, I'm going to pour right on my computer, which was maybe not the smartest idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to use my favorite sake cup, which has this cool, uh, octopus in there. And, uh, so I'll be, I'll be filling it more often than you will be probably because this is smaller and I'm spilling it all over the floor as well. So we're welcome. Yeah. I, okay. I all right. I'm going to, I'm going to do it off camera because on camera was going to kill my laptop. Yeah. I don't want to do that. So yeah, so but this is what we're looking at here. Oh yeah, it's clear. It kind of looks uh, like the test tube liquid that Professor was, uh, where he makes the little tadpoles come alive. Yeah, exactly. And join each other and get bigger. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> it, it kind of looks exactly like that. Yeah, it um, sure does. Let's uh, well bottoms up, uh, come pie. Come pie. Hmm. Wow. That is very that has a lot of flavor and a lot of fruit going on there, huh? Oh, it's I mean, it, it has a really big nose of fruit, too. I was getting I want to say melon. I want to say melon. I want to say. Uh, I'm going to say another one first. <laughs> It's so smooth. It is. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, and I would say cherry is there. Yes. It's not sweet. Clean aftertaste. Yeah, well, it is sweet. Well, but well, it's it has not a little... any kind of overly sweet. It's right, not right. any right. kind of like, oh, yucky, yucky sweet. It's... Yeah, it's not syrup sweet or, or artificially no. or anything. Yeah. No, and the aftertaste is, is clean and... Uh, no, it's a rock and sake, but you you got You you want to be ready for some taste here. This is not a, a disappearing sake, as it were. And some yeah. some some are very light, and I like them. And some are are dry, so they have a little less uh, fruitiness, and uh, that's not necessarily bad or a good thing. Um, and pairing with this, boy, you could go all kinds of places. I was having yakitori during the movie, and this is a fine follow up to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I I had a. <laughs> A tofurkey wrap, so you beat me uh, yeah. for sure. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't. Yeah, but this will <laughs> this will work with anything uh, teri teriyaki, soy sauce taste, and and way outside of that. I mean, you could be doing. Well, how does it pair with Godzilla versus Hedera? It's the exact opposite. This I is. I was going to say yes. It's a nice compliment because this is clear, clean, and unpolluted. <laughs> yes. And and the movie, unfortunately, has a, quite a lot of pollution in it, as does the planet still, unfortunately. So yeah, 1971. It's only gotten worse. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, it's. It, by the way, this is the 50 uh, year anniversary of that movie, which you know I was curious as to of all the Godzilla movies, and it may have to do with rights or something, but of all the Godzilla movies HBO Max has on it, this is one of them, and. You know, this is one of the more obscure Godzilla movies. I mean, most people in the Pantheon, they know Mothra, they know Ghidra, Ghidra, Mothra, uh, etc. However, you know, nobody, well, some people know the smog monster, but it is one of the obscure ones. And it's certainly, there's a good reason for that in a way. It's, <laughs> it's a very, very different movie than uh, most of the other Godzilla pantheon. As a matter of fact, it's the only one um, that was directed by, and I'm gonna read the name. Please. Uh, Yoshimitsu Bano. 
And Yoshimitsu Bano, pardon me, I'm grabbing my cup here. Um, he directed one and only one. And after he finished it, uh, the producer, um, and the producer's name is Tomiyaki Tanaka. He was in the hospital during the filming of the movie. So he wasn't on set and he didn't come check it out. And when he saw it afterwards, he forbid Mr. Bono from ever making another Godzilla movie. He just wasn't gonna have it. And this one is so avant-garde. It has so many elements that nothing, no other Godzilla movie has, which is why I chose it for us, uh, Wolf Mandy, because <laughs> if you're gonna choose a Godzilla movie, I mean, you, you wanna start with number one, Gojira, the real yes. horror movie, right? 1954, nuclear radiation. It's all about humans destroy, you know, building a destructive bomb to destroy the entire earth. And in order to kill Godzilla and stop him from stopping the earth, they create another weapon of mass destruction that sucks all the oxygen, that could suck all the oxygen out of the planet. It just sucks it out of certain part of the ocean that Godzilla's in. <laughs> but in order for that not to become a weapon, the person, the professor who designed it or created it kills himself. So the formula cannot be you know, tortured out of him and so on. It's a dark, Dark Allegory, a great film. Great movie. Yeah, it is a great movie. And if you're gonna start with a Godzilla movie, that's the one to start with because it says it all. It's the first, and it was not a children's movie, but in 1963, they start the new series of, and they basically make a Godzilla children's movie. Yeah. And we've all seen them. We see the battle of the rubber suits, the ridiculous monsters. That's the fun of it. That's the joy. It's laughter. There's always a kid hero. Yes. This one carries on with a kid hero, but this movie, Hedera, first of all, is the only one with political content besides Gojira. Yes. And there's a lot of political content. I mean, there's a lot of footage of horrible industrial pollution. And there's all kinds of references to, you know, we're destroying the earth. If we keep polluting, we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> global warming hadn't really entered it yet, but sure enough, uh, we're right back where we started, sort of. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, we were warned by Godzilla. Yeah. And now we're getting warned by uh, all kinds of people that we're, you know, we need to pay attention. Yeah, to or, or just the world itself and all the different natural disasters we're having. But what makes, you know, that, uh, what makes the movie so fun in spite of all, you know, it's a very dark movie if you take it like that, but the message is delivered in such a fun, psychedelic, weird way. We got, what do we, we got fish masks. We got like a lot of fun, like go-go. We got go-go dancers. We've got, you know, hippie psychedelica music, kind of. Uh, we have futuristic set of their, uh, of their, of the hippie nightclub. <laughs> That was a and cool nightclub. We have the hallucinatory uh, image that I think uh, Roger Corman took for uh, the scene in the bar when uh, in uh, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, when they start to come on to the acid and suddenly they're hallucinating and everyone is, has like a lizard mask on, basically yes. is how he does it, right? I can't believe that he didn't see that because it's, it's, it's you know, almost Straight verbatim the same thing, just on a a lot higher budget and a lot better effects and so on. Right, and, and speak, also 20 years later too, yeah. And 20 years later, right? And, and of course, this Godzilla movie uh, takes a lot from, its, from the James Bond intros with a woman in silhouette against an animated background of some kind. There's a bunch of that. Godzilla appears be, you know, behind a, uh, an animated sunset or sunrise. We don't really know, but it's just him and his red and yellow sky and him in front of it, dark. And then the opening of the movie has a, has a woman doing much the same thing, although she's not in total silhouette. You can see her face and stuff. But there's homages to all kinds of different things. Lots of weird psychedelia. There's animation. Some yeah, the of animation it, was so cool. It's, some of it's cute and cartoony. Some of it's really dark and strange. And then... Just, I mean, the juxtaposition of, of some of the, the director's cuts from one scene to another are really harsh and really, you know, 
<laughs> jarring. It's, it's out there. Yeah. I look at it more as an avant-garde art movie. And then there is the monster fight scenes as well. But interestingly, um, this movie, one of the reasons the director was uh, felt he was unfairly chastised was because he had half the budget of, of any other Godzilla movie. I'm not sure why. Maybe because he was untested. I don't know. And he shot it all, everything, in 35 days. Wow. So, wow. I know. And that's, I think, also why you don't see a whole lot of the you know, the typical destruction of building scenes, mm. right? Like that's one of the things that I love about Godzilla movies. And I think everybody does is when, you know, they kick over some giant tower and it really looks like a building collapsing and they get the dust and, you know, they, they have incredible miniatures that look as realistic as it's going to look. Of course, we all <laughs> are suspending our disbelief. You know, there's a guy in a rubber suit and he's kicking over a building and he's not really you know, 60 stories tall, right? <laughs> and we know that. But in watching those, and especially in the first one, in Gojira, it's, it's remarkable how real everything looks. And as a matter of fact, my wife, who was a child when she saw it in Japan, said that she absolutely believed that that was real people in a real place and that she needed to be afraid for, of Godzilla. And that was some years hence. She wasn't born when it came out, so she saw right. it later but it was convincing to her because it looked so real and I believe it. And, and this, so- This movie is very convincing as well, obviously, right? The Hedera is the most convincing monster I think we've ever seen. It's the, it's the toxic sludge monster. It's such a great, there's four different phases. Tadpole, frog, uh, then, then, then the big monster and then the flying saw or one is the next and then we don't know what the next one is when they're showing the four right and the next one is is glitter glitter <laughs> glitter <laughs> ultra huge red glowing head with the red uh razor laser beam eye thing whatever it is the yeah, ray and, out of his eye and pulsating brain how would you yeah. like, to me he looked like uh a cthulhu christmas ornament that's <laughs> that's sure. what he's that's what he sort yeah. of looked like yeah, a little darker than, well, I mean, I don't know. I guess you don't get- Well, I mean, yeah, like a, a darker like Cthulhu, but like the yeah. sort of squid, like the little, I don't know, sort of squid mouth thing, or just like even the vertical sort of structure of him when he when he's his full thing, or even actually right. when he's just sort of sliding around on the ground. Um, I wonder, it did feel sort of Lovecraftian. He did, it did. And it also, it, it definitely feels uh, a little bit, yeah, I mean, how do you picture- pollution coming to life right i mean that's pretty that's a pretty hard thing you know yeah the blob maybe is an obvious one and certainly there's homages to the blob in this one as well there's some great oozing sludge and that it, when it goes backwards they, they really do the sludge ooze at least as good as the blob. And oh yeah, a lot of good Hedra diarrhea in this yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, and well, and I, yeah, I think the one the one uh, that we both liked the most when watching it was when Godzilla is just sort of spinning Hedra around, and then the sludge just sort of submerges a whole group of people gambling, and you just sort of see body parts splaying, and it, it's it's great because right. it looked like it was maybe this much <laughs> sludge that was thrown, but it was. <laughs> Well, then it goes in that room and it's full of it. Yeah, right. Yes. And they're buried in it, half buried. And that in and of itself, there's a, you know, you pointed out, there's a whole lot of death in this movie. I mean, you know, he, he, ex, he points his ray at several helicopters. They blow up. He falls on, uh, he falls on a, on a truck. They, they mentioned that he kills 81 people in, in the first battle at the, uh, on the docks there at the port, and it takes yeah. out 300 buildings which we don't get to see unfortunately which we <laughs> but and, we... and then you know the like more close-up death is uh those guys playing shogi right they're all mi mixing the yes. shogi tiles and then suddenly the next thing you see the room is full of sludge and their hands or faces are kind of out of it and they're all dead and like it's you know these movies are for kids and this one <laughs> You know, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's some parts of it that are probably way above the kids' heads, but, you know, who knows? The kid, again, is, of course, a hero. 
Oh, the, Ken is a great hero. Yeah, man, he is. He and you know, and he has this psychic connection with Godzilla. You know, sees him yeah. in his dreams and he's coming. It's he a telepathic message from Godzilla. Yeah, <laughs> verbatim. That is a quote, mind you, from this movie. So, <laughs> you know, you don't want to miss that. You know, right? And he and he's in those little Japanese leader hoses, which are really, you know, for most of the, you know, which are like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's suspended shorts and then this just. Was, very you know, striking look yes yeah and apparently quite typical of the time but just the same but it's a very versatile outfit because he wore it at the beach he wore it on the top of mount fuji he wore it you know at yeah. home with his dad you know when yeah. his dad's dying or doing experiments right. whatever professor's doing which right. i do appreciate that every godzilla movie the professor is the hero of some except you know like science science, science exactly. will save us and there is ourselves. even a Yes. Uh, yeah. From ourselves. From ourselves. We are the villain in this movie, uh, for sure. In the first one and this one, humans are the problem, you know, and uh, and in this one, very clearly, they are too inept to come up with a solution because they come up with a solution. And then, well, granted, the monsters do knock over the power lines that are necessary for this thing to be for the solution to work. So the monsters blew it for them there however in the end when they think they have it the humans and they're ready to go they switch the button and they blow a fuse and godzilla of course has to use his own energy to create the solution to fighting hedra so yeah we're we're screwed without godzilla as always and yeah and i think that was the perfect choice of this movie i i liked how inept everyone was except for the kid really the professor is smart too yeah but the professor's catching up with the kid all throughout oh Every yeah he kid says something then then the professor verifies that rather than you know the professor verifying it and the kid goes oh i get it no no the kid gets it and then the professor figures it out improves it or does something about it whatever. and what do you think that says we got to listen to the next generation right like uh, uh yes we do yeah uh yeah, and now so. and now that means i i think if you had done this 20 years ago it would have felt like i was the kid now it's more like okay the the next one coming up i've already i'm already the the general crying as the the circuits aren't working all right um, well this is to uh let's see greta thunberg Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. Because this movie is for her. It's yeah. just, she's been, you know, she wasn't born when it came out, but we all know who she is. She's yes. a young fighter for uh, climate change. Fighter for the planet. planet. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So it's, it's, it's bizarre that somehow the planet doesn't equal people and us because we're one in this, like, we can't exist without the other. But hey, we'll go to space, I guess. That'll be great. Yeah, um, yeah, well, you know, I, w I wish that some of them would just go to space now and save us a lot of time. There's a lot be... of people in Washington, D.C. and <laughs> Elon Musk and some others. Yeah. They can just go, man. Have it. That's, that's take true. The moon, take Mars. You go. You have a great time. We'll take this planet and uh, see if we can't take care of it better than you guys did. We'll party on Mount Fuji when it happens, baby. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah, that, that is one of my <laughs> young people. We'll yes, party we'll... on Mount Fuji. Well, that was interesting to me because that was sort of the, I guess that was the me generation. It was sort of the like young 20s. I mean, I guess I'm older than that now, but it was sort of like their solution to the smog monster to Hitera was to party on Mount Fuji and do sort of- uh, Some sort uh, of spiritual awareness. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's some brief reference to him saying something to the effect of, well, you know, it looks like it's all over. So we're going to just, you know, we're going to try to send our spirit and and go out with a bang as it were you know which i guess i appreciate that and i think that's the nice message but it's sort of really funny because it sort of seems mixed messages a they're bringing the kid along for this which right. but like and when they actually do it it's so dark and dreary the film becomes black and white which is really cool and then the guy sort of changes his mind and he's just like well, no we just have to be happy and then the movie's in color again which is yeah, and you get the electric guitars like he's playing the acoustic all by himself some sort of dirge like thing and the next thing you know man it's like electric and there's a keyboard out there and i don't know what they plugged it into but it, you know <laughs> suddenly eric clapton's joining the party you know was, and was more cool. people come from out of nowhere bonfires yeah, out of nowhere. Erupt. it's you know it's the the woodstock of 
of this movie. Um, and <laughs> I think one of the more interesting uh, elements of this movie is its soundtrack. I mean, it is all over the place. We have, um, and I don't get it. Okay, I've watched this movie at least six times, but the the music that introduces Godzilla, that brings him out, is just so <laughs> strange. It to me, it sounds like a half-speed drunken fanfare. Like it's horns and and trombones and you know some wank. It's you know probably some keyboards in there mixing to be those instruments. But it just and and always when Godzilla is appearing, he's always kind of shaky and like whoa, yeah, he... whoa, you know, he's coming <laughs> in and the music, he's going in slow motion. The music's going in this weird kind of slow motion, and I don't, yeah, you know, it's not. It's out of tune, <laughs> kind yeah, of. Well, at least yes, and, <laughs> and it's just it is slow and it's plodding and it's stretched out and yeah, it's like an accordion. They moved it out for me. Because especially the first time we hear it, it's the sunset. I would say it's a sunset because to me, it, it evoked this sort of lone, lone cowboy thing, but it didn't make, it doesn't work because the music isn't exactly spaghetti Western at all, but it sort of, it still seemed like it was trying to do that in some way. That's, that's always what it felt like to me. It was sort of like, oh, Godzilla's are on the horizon. He's the only one that can save us. And it's also like Godzilla's so alone in this movie because no one's listening to him. No one is helping him. No one can help him except for Ken, uh, our boy. But uh, that was, I guess, how I, but I agree. It's not good walk-up music. If I'm going to, to the plate <laughs> and, and, and about to hit, you know, and- uh, Yeah, this baseball, is not this, gonna energize you or the crowd. It's Everyone's gonna, gonna be me. like, Whoa, it's gonna... you know, I've entered another dimension that's slower and I'm walking through molasses with playing a trombone. I mean, I don't know. I don't get it. I, I, and I've asked, you know, people, what do you think? And they also are just confounded by it. But besides <laughs> that part, that's not, I mean, we go all over the place from really squeaky, squonky, modern classical music, like atonal stuff to get you jarred up to sweet saxophone solo playing underneath the guy, uh, you know, sw uh, in scuba gear. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's great. And then you have, you know, fast rock and roll which of course you would to to show the the dance uh, you know hall and uh, all the things but it's just to, to me it, i think it's very very striking and also this the person who did the soundtrack for this one is a one-off as well oh so a lot of things about this movie are not the same as any other movie you could expect you know things from a godzilla movie and in this movie you can expect to see some fighting in rubber suits and there's plenty of it but in this one also there's only in in well there's several versions of the monster that godzilla fights but there aren't several monsters and in most yes. of the other ones there's lots of different monsters that come in at different times or whatever some enemy monsters some you know uh, alliance monsters whatever you know allied monsters and it depends. They they will ch change it up. You might be an enemy in one movie and then a friend in another. Right. I mean, because it's like wrestling, right? You know, it's 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. There's a heel, you know, and, and alliances and all that stuff. It's a show. But like I I when I'm listening or when I'm hearing you, I'm like, yeah, it is confounding the music. But to me, that's what makes it great, and that's what makes this movie great because it's like it's seen as a failure because it's different and weird. But it's like. I, we've seen, I mean, I know we appreciate the buildings being crushed and we appreciate the disaster, but I don't think we've seen the sludge. We haven't seen this movie, this version. And that's, I'm, I'm here for this. And it's a bummer that it's one and done or that we have to go back to the formula after this. Um, so, so interestingly, when they made it and you saw at the, at the end of the movie, it says, will there be another one? Mm. It was made to have us, it was intended that there would be a sequel to this movie. And that mm. was going to be made in, in Africa. I'm not sure which country in Africa, but it was said it was Whoa. going to be filmed in Africa, which, okay. And I would love to have seen the next version of this movie. I, I did not mind the avant-garde, the art aspect of this movie. This, this movie went to a lot of places that lots of 60s films do and that are considered, you know, cutting edge, great, you know, filmmaking and all this stuff. And I don't know if this is great filmmaking. Um, it's kind of it, throwing a bunch of shit at the wall 
but like literally yeah literally yeah. that happens throughout the, the, the movie <laughs> yes <laughs> shit thrown at the wall and and it's it may be toxic but it, it's definitely exactly that happens but there's just other aspects of it i mean just the, the weird you know when they when they cut to the tv scenes at first yes. there's like one tv with a baby in it crying and then there's there's more and then there's a whole bunch of them and then it just gets all psychedelic yeah kaleidoscope and, uh, sort of a yeah. thing with the we have skulls we just have skulls yeah. like nodding or like and, and then the right. baby is, there's always one baby crying and then right. all these people yelling because it's like a newscast basically right. everyone's or, or everyone's calling for help from the government that's what it is and it's actually like right. really cool and effective like they're so hopeless or but m intermingled with that is yeah the crying baby the baby's in sludge right like it's just like uh the, or, or is that a different <sighs> later because i know uh, there's a, a baby in sludge at some point well, there's the kitten in sludge. I think the baby's in sludge too. Really? Oh my gosh. Now I have to watch it yet again uh, <laughs> to see that. You know, I didn't notice that, but it would only, I mean, I, I it wouldn't surprise me a bit. That I missed that part if that's true, because I was I mean, just noticing the baby crying and, you know, and I the think politician's not listening, but. That, and then, well, and that one we just sort of nod our head like oh yeah this tracks the yeah. but like yeah you broke every rule if you put kitten a kitten in sludge and you put a baby crying in sludge like that's a this director's a hero for doing that exactly uh, or he yeah. sees it when he's on the roller coaster like and that you know they come out of i forget what they come out of but suddenly you're on a roller coaster and it's like what and the whole reason is for ken to be able to see godzilla where no one else can see him off in the horizon for a split second and he's going we've got to get off this now godzilla's coming and that means hedra's coming too and you know it's like we were in an amusement park but we're on a roller coaster of course that is an obvious reference to what's going on right but, but it's like uh, I don't know. It, there, there's just so much in this movie about movie making and weird cuts and the images. And to think, all right, I've got 35 days to make this. I have half the budget of anybody else. And I still got to have a guy, a bunch of guys fighting, but I want to make my movie. So he sneaks these parts in there, like the skeletons dance, you know, yes. and they've got a red background, they're white skeletons, they're dancing, uh, you know, it's animated. And then, and then they go upside down and stuff. And it's just like, and it's only a few seconds of the movie, but it's priceless. I love it. And it's so, so appropriate for your show with Halloween and all this going on. You know, it's, it, this is the most Halloween-esque Godzilla movie there is, except for Gojira, which again, serious movie, not so serious movie. Yeah, you know? no, but, but this has serious implications. It about sure it. does. And, and it's um, all the more, it's all the more, affecting because here we are the 51st anniversary of this movie and you know cars have make a little less pollution now and we have a little less industrial pollution maybe but not i mean it on an individual basis but planet-wide it's worse we've heated the planet up now we some people knew then the oil companies knew in the 70s they had projected climate change based on fossil fuel exhaust but the rest of us, normal people, didn't. We're not scientists. We aren't looking at that. But they, of course, buried that evidence and kept selling us gasoline. But we were we were looking around in 1971, and some things, you know, we got the Clean Air Act. You know, we got uh, a bunch of other things. You know, Clean Water Act as well. Here, uh, people did become environmentally aware. Things did change. I mean, we do have. You know, our cars don't pollute as much, but we just have so many more cars <laughs> yeah, that it doesn't, you know, that the pollution is still rising. I mean, you couldn't see, you know, across the block in Beijing, you know, three years ago. Right. And, and that's because of car exhaust and, of course, their industrial pollution. And right. that was like L.A. 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago now or more. We started cleaning up after the 70s, you know, and into the 2000s, it's our air, in fact, is cleaner, but it's not cleaner in terms of the heat and all the things that are going on. Right. And all the other. Yeah. Right. Do we do we need do we need a big concert with uh, the go go dancers to remind us to ask us where all the fish have gone? Is that like uh, I mean, it does take the news like it's easier to take the news when she's singing that for sure or or, or it's definitely yeah, or her list of chemicals i mean that's so you know just that alone uh, in the movie 
the, just to hear a rock song, you know, have the word cadmium in it, you know, or cobalt and a bunch of other, you know, ridiculously horrible chemicals that she just, it's this big list, you know, of elements and stuff. I mean, it, this movie, I tell you, there's so much in it that isn't limited to a Godzilla movie, right? And that's why I think the powers that be in the Godzilla world were like, well, you're done. You know, we're right. not having this again. You, you don't, this is not your soapbox, but hey, it, it's, you know, so it's a unique movie in the Godzilla pantheon, but it is a very valid Godzilla movie too, because at the end, uh, I asked you to pause it there and Godzilla looks back at the humans and he's only got one eye at this time. And somehow or another, he manifests this expression like, all right, you children, you have been naughty and I fixed your problem. You're not going to do this again, are you? And the guilty kids are like, <gasps> you know, the general's like, Aah! you know, because he's looking, you know, he is, a, he is an admonishing parent who has yes. solved the problem, saved the kids, saved you from yourself, and is now saying, you don't get a second chance. And Will you there know, be another? Yeah. Will there be another? Well, yeah. I mean, again, yomi, sake? yomi is yummy. All right. Yomi so is yummy. You, that's our review. If you're looking for a can of sake for your next picnic, if you can keep it cold, that's going to help you. But whatever your picnic is, this would go with a salami sandwich as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Everything goes with a salami sandwich as far as well, I'm concerned. Or, you know, a good prosciutto or something. I mean, this is right up there. The nice cheese. If you're it's, on, you know, a Swiss maybe with, with some like a Jarlsberg, something rich like that. Uh, yeah, because it's- Certainly go with any, you know, nuts of any kind, you know, some almonds, whatever. It's a, it's a versatile, a versatile sake and a, uh, well, and it's not too powerful in terms of the flavor. It has a lot of things going on, but like you said, all these uh, various foods would be a nice complement with it. Uh, and it's sort of like the movie where you can just throw anything in it, in that movie, <laughs> and it somehow works. Uh, yeah, and and it did. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, well, Tom, I think I mean I was we had so, there's so much more Godzilla we could talk about. I think, um, but maybe this is just part one. Will there be another Tom? I think I think I hope so. I hope um, so. If I had to recommend a movie that certainly is has some plot resonance with reality, this is the one. I mean, we need this movie in our time. Yeah. We do. We, we needed it then. We need it now. Yeah, and, I know. And it goes down as smooth as, as smooth as this sake because of how weird it is. And that's why I think it's perfect for this, because I think that's what I'm trying to. That's what we're all trying to celebrate. I think October is a weird time. It's a little spooky. It's a little bit off. Human race is off. We're off. We're at our best when we embrace that and, and when we accept that as who we are. And that's uh, Tom, I think you taught me that growing up in a lot of ways. So I, I really, uh -oh. I, I, I really appreciate that. And it, and it feels like sort of a fun, uh, you know, we got the monster kids together here. So it's really cool. Um, it is. It's and it was, you. it was and, fun. To, it's fun. Absolutely. And, and happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I, thanks again, Tom, for doing this. And I just, as always want to mention that I'm sort of doing this in conjunction with a fundraiser for my friend Chris uh, with the Trevor Project and the Trevor Project. Although I will say, if we can donate to the environment also in this episode, that would sort of make a lot of sense as well. But I think if we help people, that will then in turn help the environment. It's all the same monster that we're trying to combat here. And uh, so the Trevor Project is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping LGBTQ plus youth. And uh, so there, there will be a link below if you can spare any change. I know times are tough. Um, but in the meantime, I will be back tomorrow, Godzilla willing, uh, with, uh, I believe, yeah, we are starting, we're continuing on HBO Max. The HBO Max is probably the best streaming app, I'll say it. Uh, it, it has, we're starting three Nightmare on Elm Streets with the first one tomorrow. This is a movie that I have seen before, but it's been a while. And I haven't seen any of the other ones. So I'm excited to get into some nightmarish scenarios uh, with my friend Maury, uh, a Freddy expert. So you have your homework. I have mine. And I will see you at the next phase of the moon. Cheers. Cheers. Kampai. Yummy, yummy. And carry on, Wolf Mandy.
Let's howl at the moon for the friends we miss, the friends we wish were here to see this. Ow, ow, ow! ow.